I'm here to substitute for John O'Neill, a, a man that I worked for in some capacity or another some 28 years when I was working in flight operations. Um, he was my branch chief in the beginning, later became deputy division chief, and later deputy director of, of the mission operations director. All of that time, which uh, I was working somewhere in the flood operations business. To give you a little background uh, about flood operations, it's evolved over the last uh, 40 years or, or more. Uh, back in the beginning, um, in the early Apollo days, there were two flight operations organizations doing the basic flight operations work. There was a flight crew operations directorate that not only uh, where the astronauts um, resided, but uh, also did crew training, crew procedures, crew flight plans, and did some work with engineering to do things like uh, rendezvous. Uh, and there was a flight operations directorate that did uh, the mission control center, built the mission control center, put it together from scratch, I might add. You can buy a mission control center today, but back in those days you had to invent it. Uh, they did um, mission planning analysis, figured out how to get to the moon, how to, what the algorithms ought to be, and so on and so forth, and did the fundamental trajectory development and, and uh, and, and, and guidance and so on and so forth that allowed us to, to do the planning. They also had what was called a flight control division. These were the guys that sit in the mission control center and, and monitor the systems and, and, um, and advise the astronauts on, on how to react to, to uh, failures or unexpected events. Um, after my first 28 years in, in, in flight operations, I moved to the program office, spent 12 years in various phases of, uh, of uh, the program office. So I had the opportunity to observe flight operations not only firsthand in participating in it, but also from the program point of view of, of watching these guys help us out when, when they got in trouble, Frank. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about what I consider, from a biased point of view, perhaps to be one of the premier organizations in human spaceflight. Um, now I can tell you up front that most people who work in mission operations would say it is the premier organization. But I trust that each one of you who have the opportunity to, to uh, work in human spaceflight think your organization is the premier organization. For indeed, they are outstanding organizations that do a great job. When I was a shuttle program manager, I often told the team, you're the greatest team on the face of the earth. And I believed that at that time, and I still believe it. The people who fly humans in space are the best team uh, that you can find anywhere. So my hat's off to all of those. So what, what is MOD like? I'm going to talk today about five lessons that made the Mission Operations Directorate a unique and premier organization. Chris Kraft, who was perhaps the father or maybe the grandfather of flight operations, the first flight director in the Mercury program, said this flight operations didn't exist in the beginning. We had to write the book. And, and indeed, they did write the book. <clears throat> Kraft gives the credit to Gene Kranz, the white flight of Apollo 13. Um, and, um, and Gene indeed put the details, and he was and is a detail person, by the way. Uh, and I'll talk more about that later. But he put the details of, of, of the flight operations system together and the culture built the culture and made it what it is today. And, and it survived some 15 years after he, re, he retired. Um, there are five lessons that I, I, I would like to talk about briefly. The first one is technical leadership matters. The second one is culture is everything. The third is technical excellence is the standard. Fourth is, it's all about the team. 
And the fifth thing is you need simulations that challenge. Um, first of all, technical leadership. Kraft and Krantz led from, a, from technical leadership. They were involved in the technical decisions of the organization. They asked pointed and challenging questions. And, and I always remember Gene Krantz, who was an unusual individual. He could take notes and listen at the same time. And I never figured out how to do that. But he, he took an, an enormous notes. He also, MOD has schematics that's drawn particularly for the fly operations people that show all of the electrical and physical interfaces and valves and so on and so forth. Krantz would always have a set of those and marked up in multiple colors so he could read them. He, he was involved in the technical decisions and he made, um, he could make, uh, he could ask you difficult questions. Chris Kraft was an unusual individual in terms of being able to, is an unusual individual, 87 years old as a few months ago. Just had the Mission Control Center named after him, the Christopher Kraft uh, Mission Control Center last Thursday. But he could also ask difficult questions and pointed questions that and that, that made you understand that you needed to be responsible and accountable for what you did. They also provided unusual leadership and, and demonstration of, of their confidence in you and, and your ability to get the job done. I remember one time when we were getting ready to deploy on an Apollo mission and some, uh, some person suggested to Kraft that his flight controllers who, involve, who were involved in a recovery out on a Navy ship off the coast of Brazil should fly out uh, from Brazil on, on a, um, an aircraft, which the name I've forgotten at, at this point. And Kraft looked at the management in that system and said, my flight controllers are not going to fly in that airplane. And of course they didn't. Um, that instilled a great deal of confidence in the flight control team that Dr. Kraft uh, was concerned about them. Uh, Gene Krantz had the same kind of attitude in terms of leadership. I remember once when a, uh, when a young flight controller was in a situation quite, where he had been accused of robbing a bank. Now this guy didn't rob the bank as it turned out. But he had a huge debt uh, financial problem in terms of uh, making sure he had a good uh, lawyer uh, defending him. So they had a fundraising. Gene Krantz uh, was white flight. His wife made white vests for him on each flight. And um, he wore this f vest during the flight as a symbol of the white flight and so on and so forth. He brought the Apollo 11 uh, vest to this uh, this uh, auction where we were raising money for this young man and auctioned it off. A group of his flight controllers got together and put together a large amount of money and contributed to the purchase of, of White's uh, flight's vest and then gave it back to White Flight. Uh, an indication of, of Gene's dedication to the team and also the team's dedication to, to him as a leader. I've often told people, and it's a little bit of an exaggeration, that the mission operations team would follow Gene Krantz off the top of Building 1 at the Johnson Space Center. Now, Building 1 is nine stories tall. A little bit of an exaggeration, of course, but it gets the point across that people were dedicated and believed in him and, and Chris Kraft, particularly because they believed that he was always doing what he thought was right and supporting them. So technical leadership matters. It is extremely important. Second, the culture is everything. There's a unique, perhaps, culture within the Mission Operations Directorate. You've probably heard, particularly if you saw the movie, Apollo 13, that failure is not an option. 
Lucy Krantz stood before an FIR, a shuttle FIR, and said, my dad had it wrong, failure is an option if you don't take care of your P's and Q's. So we know that failure really is an option, but the thought that Gene put forth in that statement, if indeed he did during Apollo 13, <laughs> is indeed the attitude he had toward the work that the mission ops team did. He, did not, he wanted failures to not happen, or, or, or to flight operations team to always have the ability to recover from, uh, from failures. His theme was, was and is, I'm sure, tough and competent. You never know when you're going to be put in the gap to fill the bre breach, to be able the one individual that matters and make a difference in the future. Uh, Frank, uh, when, when, uh, it, and Russ, when Apollo 12 happened, lightning struck the vehicle, all those circuit breakers opened that Russ talked to you about, put the circuit breakers back on. Uh, three hours later, we launched off to the moon with, with the Saturn IV. Uh, but in the meantime, the flight control team determined, led by John Aaron, who was the electrical engineer, that indeed the vehicle was in a satisfactory condition to continue to go to the moon. John had prepared for that job and, um, and was put in the breach and he made the, made the recommendation that we proceed and go ahead and, 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 and go to the moon. Later John played, a just one flight later, John played a major role in putting the system together to recover from the crew on Apollo 13. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So tough and competent is, uh, means being, making hard decisions, being ready when your turn comes to be put in the gap and fill the breach. Um, also, it's a challenging environment an environment where people are continually challenged by their management, the senior management, and each other that we have the correct and, and, and proper answer. Um, I uh, know we, we could have knockdown, down, drag out discussions in, in terms of what was the correct technical direction to take. Um, and in some environments, you may find that you don't do that with your boss. In, in this environment, that was okay. And the next day, the, dis the, the uh, vigorous discussions were forgotten and you move on to the next event. It was the culture and is the culture of the mission operations director to have these interchanges and these difficult discussions and, and sometimes difference of opinions. That's okay. Um, You know, um, a story about uh, the Russian Mir pr program. When I was the Russian, when I was uh, the NASA program director for Shuttle Mir, and we were flying the first shuttle mission, we had a vigorous discussion with the Russian uh, pro program project manager, program manager at that time, about a a plan that he wanted to do. He wanted to undock the Soyuz, fly around to the side, take a picture, which he called the picture of the century of the Russian, of the, of the shuttle undocking from the, from the mirror after we had been there. I, uh, conven I worked hard at convincing him that that was not a particularly good idea, that bad things could happen with two vehicles flying away from, uh, from the shuttle mirror and something that we hadn't done before and the cosmonauts ought to be in the, the mirror taking care of the mirror system and so on and so forth. I could never change his mind because Mr. Semyonov, who was a head of operations and uh, of the company that ran all of operations in the, in the Russian system, had directed him to go get the picture for the century. Um, and in the Russian culture, you don't challenge your boss. 
Boss decides, that's okay, he's responsible, we'll press on. In this environment, challenging your boss is a good deal. You're encouraged to, uh, to, to challenge your boss. I would go on later, maybe tomorrow, and talk about being careful to do that. But nevertheless, <laughs> challenge your boss is a good idea. To finish the mere story, the cosmonauts indeed un undocked, flew around, and something happened in the mirror that was unexpected. It did an attitude maneuver that was not in their program, not at least it was, they thought it wasn't in their program, did an attitude maneuver. The Russian pilots <clears throat> were engaged in flying back to get redocked and did not get the picture of the century. Um, the third area is, is technical excellence. And technical excellence in this case is not obtained by going to school, going to the classes, not even Apple classes. Uh, uh, <laughs> it is obtained by some unique uh, activities that people do to get ready to go fly. Um, some of those begin back in the development phase of the program. These flight controllers and, and mission plan and analysis people are involved in the development of the program. They learn about the spacecraft and participate in the decision process uh, during the devel development pro process. So they learn firsthand about the vehicle as it's being developed and why it was built the way it was and how it, why, how it is uh, designed to operate. So being involved in the development process is extremely important. They also develop a set of flight rules. Uh, flight rule document, there's two. Uh, there's a book ca called the generic flight rules that apply to all flights, and there's a flight Pacific flight rules that, that apply to the Pacific flight of, uh, that you're flying uh, next week, for example, uh, in 10 days from now. Um, and um, these are developed for every imaginable situation that might occur. If this happens, you'll do this. Now, sometimes we don't think of everything, but nevertheless, it's quite a, an extensive document. It gets developed in the end of, at the beginning of the program and evolves over the time. And uh, after Challenger, we added a rationale section to the document. So if you, if you, uh, obtained a copy of the generic flight rules today, you'd find not only the flight rules, but the rationale of why they are the way they are. The flight controllers develop those. I'm, I might back up a notch and, and, and add in, in some flight operations environments, such as the DOD where they fly satellites, something goes wrong with the satellite, they usually have a, a safe in function, the satellite goes to sleep, if you will, and says, and basically says, I'll, I'm asleep until you get ready to tell me what to do next. They call engineering, engineering tells them what to do, and then they go execute uh, what engineering said. Fly, fly, mission operations has a lot of support from engineering, but they, uh, they have a plan on what to do or they develop a plan on what to do. We also have procedures. Um, it might surprise you that when we went to the moon, there were 70 pounds of, of documents, paper documents on board the command module. Uh, such things as, as procedures, schematics, uh, malfunction procedures, and so on, and many different versions of those. In the lunar module, there was 35 pounds, for a total of 105 pounds of documents. The flight controllers develop those. They don't buy them uh, as some operating organizations do. So they're building knowledge. Um, the um, schematics, mission operations develop a flight operations set of schematics that I talked about earlier that, that Gene Krantz marked up with his pencils, uh, with his red markers, so he could understand the schematics ready. They were easily read schematics over engineering uh, schematics, um, 
and, but more importantly, the process of generating these schematics instill knowledge and, and, and understanding of the systems in, in, into the flight controller's mind. Um, now, my goal as a flight director, back when I was both a, a active flight director and later chief of the flight director, what I told the team, the flight directors and the people who worked for them, is that you ought to be as smart as those engineers uh, about the system. And of course, that was quite a, quite a challenge. But concurrently with that, we, Mission Operations also has a, a partnership with sustaining engineering that is extremely important. Mission Operations does not fly missions alone. They fly a mission, they fly a mission with the support and help of all of the sustaining organizations that, that supply hardware and software for the, for the vehicle they're operating. And, and that's extremely important in the, in the relationships. I, I will admit to you that there's a little friction between those two on who's in charge every once in a while, a little friction that, is in, that in, the, in, in the end is very important. Uh, the fourth area is it's a team. It is a team effort. It takes the entire team to get the job done. I'm talking about the team within mission operations as well as the global team of the engineering community and the system uh, of the sustaining guys all over the country, including the contractors who get involved. Um, the teams are established and flight directors each have a call sign. In the beginning, it was white, red and blue. Or, uh, Chris Kraft was blue, uh, Gene Kranz was white, and John Hodge was blue. But each team has that identity of being associated with that particular color and that particular uh, flight director in terms of, of, of being coming together as a team. Um, as I grew older, I learned that the team could do far more working together that can do far more than a group of individuals. Far more productive and, far, and m much more likely to get the correct answer than, than a bunch of individuals working individually. The fifth thing is simulations that challenge. The Mission Operations Organization has a strong simulation team that puts simulations together to challenge the team. Um, their leader, called a sim soup, is equivalent to the flight director in the, in the MOD environment in terms of his status, if you will. Um, and, and their challenge is to challenge the team. Their job is to challenge the team. I was an ascent flight director, among other things, ascent entry and orbit. Um, I, I did all of those at different various times. In fact, I did them all on one flight, uh, on five, when uh, STS-5, when, when a guy uh, quit on us, uh, left, I guess is the best way to say that. Um, but anyway, um, I often said that uh, Sim Soup would give us 29 failures in eight minutes and 30 seconds. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but he literally gave us a, every controller in the building something to work on during ascent, which worked okay for the controllers, but I'll tell you, a flight director uh, sometimes had a hard time keeping up with what was going on with those, all of those failures. But the first time I sat on the console on, S, on, on the shuttle program, at, at three minutes, I've got a into ascent. I got a call and said, the "APU hydraulics on system three is not cooling," and um, we're watching the temperature rise. At um, at seven minutes into the flight, which seemed like an hour later, by the way, Steve McClendon told me, "Turn the APU off." Now, what difference did that make? The APU control the thrust, uh, the, the mixture ratio of a single main engine and the gimbling of a single main engine. So we're returning a third 
of the, of the system off in terms of taking care of the mix, mixture ratio and the gimbling system that controlled a, the attitude. Um, so I directed the flight direct, uh, the Capcom to, to, to tell the crew to, to turn the APU off. He did. I'm told that Chris Kraft was sitting on the back row and he came up over the console <laughs> wondering what in the world is that young man, he often said young man, by the way, it didn't matter how old you were, he, he used, always used the term young man, wondering what in the world that young man is de did. Some guy in Washington after that event um, wanted to establish a, a, a review team that would review all of the decisions that flight directors made. Fortunately, it was not done. Can you imagine a review team trying to make a decision in what amounted to seconds during ascent on what needed to be done? Uh, I don't think so. So thank goodness th that guy's idea didn't come to fruition. Um, but so simulations are important. To give you an idea of how intense they are, uh, the ascent flight director on STS-1, Neil Hutchinson, uh, participated in simulations for a total of 1,360 hours before he flew STS-1. Um, now, some of the other things that, that happened, uh, t Jody talked about 51F and the, and the um, and the fact that the main engine shut down. That engine shut down because of a sensor failure. I have a group of sensors on, the, on engines that can shut them down when things are going south. And, um, and the flight control team, led by Cleon Lacefield, which will be here tomorrow, uh, decided almost instantly to disable the, the uh, the sensors on the other two engines so they would not shut down. Uh, again, Cleon had been a, a booster controller in his previous life before he became a flight director. He was the guy that, that, that made the decision and responded to the rec recommendation of, of the current uh, booster engineer. Getting ready to do that uh, three-man EVA that, that uh, Frank talked about it took a lot of work on the on the uh, EVA uh, flight operations people, but probably the mission operations and the sustaining engineering operation that supported the finest hour was Apollo 13. The explosion uh, on Apollo 13 destroyed an oxygen tank and the pl plumbing that fed the fuel cell. So the, elect the primary electrical power in the command service module was lost and there's no way to keep the command service module operable for the trip home. Um, the only remaining battery po uh, power in the, in the command service module was the, was the entry batteries that, w that was to some extent discharged at that point. Um, so the team went to work with the support from engineering all over the country. I personally worked for, continuously for the next 36 hours. Uh, and, and with that kind of commitment from a large group of people, they were able to put together plans that, um, that did a, a, a large number of things. Um, a CO2 removal system. There were not enough CO2 removal cartridges in the limb to, to remove the CO2 uh, for the duration coming home. So they built a little box that would put on the inlet that would allow us to suck uh, air through that box where the, a command service module cartridge was installed. The procedures had already been put in place to use the limb as a lifeboat. So the power the power down system, the powered system, uh, how, how much you powered this limb was already determined by the limb team. Um, the powering back up of the command module as you approached the earth was a, was, a, was a big job that had to be done to power up the system from a dead spacecraft to a configuration that matched the normal procedures when you were coming back to the moon. 
the jettisoning of the, loon, the, of the limb, which had been your lifeboat for the last three days, had to be done at the right time to separate the right amount of distance before you entered the atmosphere. And literally dozens of other things that enabled the uh, crew of Apollo 13 to, to escape uh, the ultimate. So the flight operations team in, in, in Houston indeed is, is, a, is a, a unique organization and, and one of the premier organizations in the, uh, in the human spaceflight business. Additionally, in closing, I would also say that six out of 10 uh, of the shuttle program managers have, a, have come from the Mission Operations Directorate. Five out of those 10 were previous flight directors. Now, I would confess to you up front that part of that's because of the exposure that they get. I get a lot of exposure, I get a lot of TV time, answering uh, questions from the media, and so on and so forth. But um, I can also tell you that flight directors and, uh, learn how to ask those tough questions. They learn how to ask pointed questions. They ask how to ask those questions even when they're not knowledgeable individuals. So they learn the skills of, of, of interacting and asking appropriate questions and making decisions. That's what a flight director's job is, to be able to ask questions and to make decisions or to confirm the recommendations and make decisions that the flight controllers make. So um, when you hear about the Mission Control Center in Houston, that's a unique crowd of dedicated people who stand ready to stand in the gap. Now something about the future uh, in, in this business, uh, which I think will be different, First of all, the commercial world, perhaps the commercial world in someday will indeed be a taxi service that taxis people to, to low Earth orbit at least. Um, and, and perhaps flight operations will be provided by the commercial provider. Uh, in the exploration program though, when you go to some place far off like Mars, or any other place that you might elect to go. Communications is, to Mars, for example, is 20 minutes each way. So this real-time flight ops business where you respond to an immediate problem, tell the crew in two or three minutes what to do, is no longer the model. There's a new model that needs to be developed. I think that model involves uh, flight ops, having a new role, a different role, a role of where the flight crew is the operator of the spacecraft, and the flight ops function is one of providing the, the procedures and the sustaining in real time of the, of the onboard system. When, when the system begins to have problems, they provide the sustaining engineering and the integration of, of, of the sustaining engineering function into the procedures and, and the operating procedures on board the spacecraft. So, the, but to get that job done is going to require a Chris Kraft and a Gene Krantz and an operating flight operations team sometime in the future across all of the d disciplines to put together that uh, new model of how we're going to operate from the ground uh, to provide that kind of support to the crew in a way that provides them the, the best opportunity to be successful. So it's going to be interesting to see who will fill that gap at some time in the future. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today and, um, and we'll see you again tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much and I think it's time for questions.